Greetings. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for um, the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition's uh, webinar series, episode two. Um, we are glad you're with us today. We have a few things that we're going to go over here before we hand it over to our presenter to, um, to get going with today's presentation. A um, couple of logistical items. If you've never um, joined on the GoToWebinar site, you should be able to set your, um, your viewing preferences so that you can view in full screen or you can um, view a couple things at a time. Right now, we're not projecting any slides, but we will be uh, once our presenter gets going. So you'll be able to see the presenter on camera as well as uh, look at their slides on screen. Most of your controls are going to be over to the right hand side of your screen. Um, you will be able to also ask questions. So um, there's there's two features. One is a chat feature that um, you can type messages directly to whoever's presenting. So uh, if you use that feature, it would go to our presenter while he's talking and he probably won't be able to respond. Um, but you could send that to the um, the organizer. Um, who would be able to see your chat, but the, the main way to ask questions is to one uh, one or two slots below that chat is where it says questions, and that's where you can go ahead and send us your questions. We'll have a Q&A session at the end. And um, just a few quick words about our organization. Um, the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition was started as a nonprofit organization in the year 2012 as um, a response, a national response to grassroots movement for boarding school healing here in the United States. Uh, the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission had already gotten started and really uh, just leaders across Indian country here um, said we needed a process like that here in the US. We did have some international partners come from the Canadian TRC as uh, part of a symposium in 2011. And that's where the idea for our organization was, was started based on some work that was already going on around the country. And um, the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition was born as an official nonprofit. So um, we operated our first three years under the Native American Rights Fund with our fiscal sponsor. And we had a board of directors and um, we did not have any staff until 2015. And that's when the organization became independent. So um, we are now an independent organization, although we still work with NARF on some projects. And uh, we have a staff of two, myself uh, as the executive officer. My name is uh, Christine Dindisi McLeave. I am Turtle Mountain Ojibwe, and our office is based here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And we also have uh, our program manager, who is Rose Myron. She is um, a PhD who recently graduated from the University of Minnesota and uh, works here in our Minneapolis office. And we hope to be expanding our staff soon. So make sure you sign up for our email newsletter on our website, boardingschoolhealing.org, and watch for those updates. Um, we center our programs around education, advocacy, and healing. And so this webinar series is part of our efforts to educate uh, the general public about boarding school history, as well as our native communities about the impacts of, of boarding school history in our families um, and on our lives. So um, today's um, presenter is Preston McBride. He is a PhD candidate in history at the University of California, Los Angeles. He is Comanche by descent. He holds a bachelor's degree in economics and a master's in liberal studies from Dartmouth College. His current um, dissertation studies are focused on quantitative history um, in American Indian experiences. Uh, he's interested in the history of medicine and um, his, like I said, his current work is focused on disease in federal American Indian off-reservation boarding schools from the years 1879 to 1934. So I'm going to turn it over to Preston now and um, we'll stop at about um, the top of the hour to do uh, 15 minutes of Q&A. And handing it over to you now, Preston. Thanks, Christine. All right, before we begin, I wanna make sure on, on my end, Christine, you can see me and the PowerPoint 
Yes. Perfect. All right, uh, Mari Atwe, Nanani Etzah, Preston McBride. Um, as Christine said, I'm Comanche, Irish and Italian by descent, and I want to thank her for that introduction. Uh, she also mentioned I'm a PhD candidate at UCLA in the history department where I study um, disease and death rates at four of the largest off-reservation boarding schools. So my work particularly focuses on Sherman, Chamawa, Carlisle, and Haskell, although I know a bit about uh, a lot of the other schools. Um, before I begin, I want to first acknowledge that we're all on indigenous land. Here in Los Angeles, uh, I'm on unceded Gabrielino Tongva land. Um, and I also want to acknowledge the elders and boarding school survivors that are with us. And because of the topic of my talk, I also want to acknowledge uh, the boarding school students who are, who are no longer with us. I also want to thank NABS, uh, particularly Rose and Christine, for their tireless dedication to healing, advocacy, and education. Uh, and then I also have to thank the UCLA History Department, the UCLA American Indian Studies Center, and the UCLA uh, Institute for American Cultures for supporting me and my research over the years. And last, I want to thank all of you for, for attending this, this talk. Most of uh, boarding school history is, is not pleasant. Uh, to be sure, there are certainly things to celebrate. Um, but this presentation uh, is not a celebratory one. That, that some of the topics that I'm going to talk about may be re-traumatizing for, for some of you. So if you need to take a step away or not come back at all, that's fine. Uh, this talk and the others in this series will be online in the future. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that I am going to talk about uh, you know, some of your relatives, potentially. And I mean, I, I try to be sensitive about this and respectful, but I have chosen to, to say the names and to not use pseudonyms because families looking for these records wouldn't be able to find them uh, if I use fake names. So my talk today is, is really about Sherman Institute. Uh, it's the 27th off-reservation boarding school operated by the federal government. And it officially opens in 1902, although as we'll see, it's not quite ready to handle students in 1902. And I want to start out this talk by saying that in my experience, Sherman is one of the healthiest boarding schools. Uh, and there's reasons for this, but uh, it tends to be they have an extremely competent doctor uh, and superintendent who are in their positions for a little over 30 years, which is unprecedented in the Indian service. So many of the things I'm going to talk about today are common through the boarding school system. Uh, but it's still important to note that there are there are differences between the schools and even amongst a particular school across time. And I'm only telling one particular aspect of the boarding school experience. So to begin on your screens, you'll see a couple of premises that I have. Uh, first, the health of Native communities today is directly connected to health in the past. The underfunding of of boarding schools had consequences, as does the underfunding of IHS facilities, schools, and prisons today. Second, the strength of indigenous communities today is directly connected to historic, their historical resiliency and survival. Third, historical records are, are important. Um, the destruction of indigenous records have high stakes. Many boarding school students uh, are what I'm gonna talk about as being administratively disappeared. And when the records are destroyed or lost, indigenous data sovereignty uh, is attacked. And my last premise that I want to get into, particularly around health, and what makes this story uh, even more tragic is the fact that these are all children and young adults. Boarding school populations typically are between 14 and 25, which are the least likely demographic of any population to sicken and die. There are some exceptions. So the Spanish flu of 1918 was a particular disease that attacked generally young people, um, but, but generally speaking, children and young adults are the healthiest uh, portion of any population. So colonialism and boarding schools in particular changed this. So as I said, Sherman opened in 1902. Um, like the schools that had come before it, it was based on the premise of assimilation. You can see here Richard Henry Pratt, um, the founder of the first school, Carlisle, in, in 1879, he summed up assimilation saying, all the Indian there is in a race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. This quote is typically shortened to kill the Indian, save the man. Uh, and it's an explicit call for school officials to perpetrate what we know today as cultural genocide. And many scholars have detailed the government's multifaceted approach 
at industrial education and assimilation, including the cutting of uh, hair, military dress, and forbidding indigenous languages in these institutions. And then they, re, uh, they enforced these uh, regulations with corporal punishment, forced labor, and military-style discipline. Indigenous children responded in a variety of ways, including deserting in great numbers. And the work of uh, detailing these boarding school histories from the everyday to the extraordinary is vitally important. The next two speakers in this particular series have done much throughout their careers to expose all of this by using oral histories and native voices from the archives. Yet the field is, is extremely understudied. Well less than half of the 26 off-reservation boarding schools by 1900 have book-length monographs written about them, and very, very little has been written about the schools on reservations. We'll get into the numbers a little bit later, but this is slowly changing as, as more and more scholarship is done about these institutions. Now, before we get into Sherman, I want to juxtapose Pratt's quote with a quote from a U.S. Indian inspector uh, seven years later, William J. McConnell, and he's writing this as he's going around inspecting schools. He says, we are little less than murderers if we follow the course we are now following after the attention of those in charge has been called to its fatal results. Hundreds of boys and girls are sent home to die that a sickly sentiment may be patronized and that institutions where brass bands, foot and baseball are the principal advertisements may be maintained. So he's calling out in the, in the late 1800s uh, the lethality of these institutions. And that's particularly what's the least understood about these schools. Sorry. Um, so in particular, the school's physical toll on indigenous bodies is less understood. The emphasis on cultural destruction has tended to overshadow the system's biological destruction. This talk, I hope, is an effort to begin addressing the lethality. My main argument is that in the process of trying to kill the Indian, federal boarding schools designed explicitly for American Indian assimilation were lethal, and a currently unknown number of Indian children uh, died in them. School administrators concealed epidemics, illnesses, and student deaths, and federal reports underreported deaths on many occasions. Archival evidence held in the National Archives demonstrates all of this. So today we're gonna to spend some time mainly on, on two particular epidemics uh, at Sherman. They're seven years apart. The first one's in 1904 and the second one is in 1911. And uh, we're gonna pay particular attention to how the schools responded and reported the epidemics. So again, this talk is mainly about Paris and Sherman. Uh, Paris and Sherman are kind of conjoined schools. Paris opened in 1892, and the superintendent, uh, Howard Hall at the time when Sherman was founded, is the superintendent over both of these schools. Ideally, um, the younger children went to Paris and the older children uh, went to Sherman to build it. Uh, as I said before, Sherman opened in 1902, but it really wasn't ready for students' uh, habitation uh, until probably about 1905. But in, the, um, in these schools, um, Howard Hall in particular is, is writing to his superiors, telling them that the students were barefoot, running out of clothes, and running out of food. Uh, or beyond that, the schools were overcrowded uh, pretty much yearly. And in these situations, students began uh, falling ill with increasing frequency. Um, that's not all that surprising. At least two students died in 1903 including one who, who, quote, died on the way home of pneumonia. And there was debate in the school's records about whether the school should pay for the boy's coffin because the boy did not die at the school. So in the entire collection of, of Sherman's records in the National Archive, millions and millions of pages, the only mention of this boy's illness or death was a financial requisition asking for payment, uh, for permission for the school to be reimbursed for his coffin. Um, around this time, 1903, federal officials in Washington, D.C. began to take notice of high death rates, particularly in Southern California. That September, uh, the Commission of Indian Affairs forbade overcrowding in the schools and ordered that, quote, Indian children should be educated, but should not, however, be destroyed in the process. Health is the greatest consideration. But this directive was ignored at Sherman and many other schools. The schools remained overcrowded and health was not the greatest consideration. At Sherman, expansion was. So as I mentioned, all the students, the older students who go to Sherman from 1902 
onwards are literally building the school. They're not actually going for an education there. And this, um, this attention to health is really important. Um, the following month in October of 1903, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs wrote Hall again pertaining to, quote, the number of deaths at Paris. Hall responded, quote, I have the honor to state that in reality, no students died at the school. Hall, a veteran superintendent at that time, uh, sent terminally ill children home to die so that they would not count against the school's roles. He continued, quote, one boy, however, died on the way home from pneumonia and tubercular complication. His death was inevitable. So he was permitted to be moved. Also, one girl soon died after arriving at her home from heart trouble. I want to say that no death in these schools was inevitable. Um, schools typically have higher death rates than reservations, so children would have been better off health-wise staying at home. In response to, to Hall um, kind of deflecting blame for the deaths, the commissioner responded, quote, the, de the death rate at Paris school is far in excess of the average of non-reservation schools, and there must be some reason for it. But little changed. Days after this letter, three days after this letter, an epidemic of smallpox broke out at and two teachers quit fearing for their own lives. The school responded to the epidemic by setting up tents outside to quarantine suspected cases. Hall reported over 40 cases of smallpox, including several very sick children, while noting that some students, for fear of their own lives, deserted from the school. The next month in November, the Indian Affairs Commissioner at the time was W.A. Jones, William A. Jones, blamed Hall for the severe epidemic. He said, quote, those who have had the smallpox were kept in your school for more than a week before they were vaccinated. The circular positively requires vaccination either before they enter the school or at the date of entrance. So Hall again ignored another directive and it permitted health uh, or permitted smallpox to enter the school. Had he followed the directive, all of the students would have been uh, vaccinated and smallpox would not have become an epidemic. So we're going to jump now to the to the next year, 1904, which is a very drastic year. Um, Hall requested increased appropriations to lessen the overcrowding at the school and to promote a healthier environment, but he was rejected. Acting Commissioner of Indian Affairs A.C. Tonner wrote him in that May, quote, these additions would necessitate a doubling up of the appropriation. And you can rest assured that the difficulty in the future will be not double the appropriations, but to get what is absolutely necessary. That October, Hall telegrammed Washington, quote, some actions should be taken at once regarding water for Paris or filth diseases will soon follow. The only thing now to do is to bring pupils to Riverside or to Sherman. Too late to experiment and hold pupils there as the water now used for drinking is contaminated. 60 of the pupils sick yesterday after drinking water. Sewage not flushed for three weeks, end quote. Two days later, he again wrote to the commissioner, quote, the continuance of a school under such conditions is not only futile, but endangering the health of pupils and employees. It is impossible to keep a school with 130 pupils in sanitary condition. Both employees and children are complaining of being sick, and it looks as if it is a forerunner to much sickness. I want to highlight that, a forerunner to much sickness. Not only was the drinking water contaminated, but to give you a historical background, backdrop of this. You can see in this map on the far, far right side is Paris, the uh, southernmost of the blue dots. That whole valley um, had all of its irrigation shut off in 1899 by a U.S. district court who ruled that San Bernardino and the Redlands had preempting water rights. So the school operated for three years without water, and it was in really dire condition. Uh, recognizing this, this the, um, there's an inspector at the school at the time. He agreed with Hall and the Commissioner of Indian Affairs ordered Hall to close Paris, but he cautioned against overcrowding Sherman. Now, to put this in perspective, both schools were overcrowded by about 100 students each. So there would have been essentially, let's say, 500 students in a school designed for 300, and 500 students in a school with supplies for 300. Um, so Hall, or so Tonner, the, the Commissioner, he warned, warned Hall about overcrowding schools and, quote, endangering the health of pupils. Hall again ignored this directive by transferring pupils to 20 miles away from Paris to Riverside, uh, and he overcrowded the school. To his defense in this case, the conditions at Paris were such that he needed to get the children out of there. 
The extent to which um, conditions at Paris inhibited student health can never be known. Um, many of the records have been destroyed or lost, and in fact, very little documentation from the school exists besides some, some correspondence sent to the commissioner, and certainly no student files. And this remains true for the vast majority of schools in their early period, really besides Carlisle. So Haskell had a fire in the early 1900s, which destroyed all of the records uh, going back to 1884. They have one book that survived, but it's, it's really partial information. So the first epidemic we're really going to dive into, uh, although not as in-depthly, um, is the 1904 typhoid epidemic. Accounts of this have been published. So Jean Keller has done two of them. This is the, the picture is of her, her journal article in the American Indian Culture and Research Journal, specifically about the epidemic. But then she also wrote a book about Indian health at Sherman, um, which is listed at the bottom. It's called Empty Beds. And because she's gone through this, I'm not going to go through the detail. It's been published. But I am going to offer an alternative explanation. The epidemic happened as Hall was transferring students. Um, in fact, I'm going to argue that he imported the epidemic. Typhoid fever is an extremely contagious and deadly disease. Student immune systems already compromised from previous epidemics and endemic illnesses, uh, such as the, the smallpox epidemic that I mentioned a few moments ago, failed to combat typhoid's virulence. The disease, aptly named, uh, produces a sustained high-grade fever of around 103 to 104 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for upwards of a month. After the onset of, of the fever symptoms, students would have also experienced headaches, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and vomiting for, for upwards of a month. And some children, especially those who died or uh, were sent home ill, likely experienced even, severe even more severe complications, including uh, pneumonia and internal hemorrhaging. In response to this epidemic, Hall again established a tent hospital, hired additional nurses, and set off to find the source of contagion. Um, in part, these epidemics are so deadly because the school doesn't have a hospital at this point. The school's hospital is built in 1905 after this epidemic. But my point about this epidemic is it was, it was deadly. Um, Lily Edwards, a student from Round Valley, Matteo Coutts, a Luceno man from Rincon, Johnny or Dan Edwards, also from Round Valley, Mamie Alphys from Klamath, John Powers, Wailaki, and George Summers, Pomo, all contracted the, the disease and died at the school. And I'm saying their names. A fully loaded cost accounting, which is a term that I'm borrowing from Nell Irving Painter when she's talking about the, the true costs of African-American chattel slavery uh, in black communities, but also in white society. This kind of analysis demands it, in part because the reports largely sidestep uh, this particular epidemic's lethality. In his annual report for the year 1904, Hall only reported, quote, the general health of the pupils has been good. Although in the fall, we were troubled with some sickness, end quote. Some sickness, that was it. 11 students died at Sherman that year, seven from typhoid epidemic and four previous to the epidemic. And neither one of, not one of them or any of the epidemics that year enter into his uh, annual report. Hall also conveniently ignored the fact that the school did not have a hospital or a full-time doctor. He also ignored other possibilities for the disease's emergence at that particular time. He tested the water at Paris and determined that it couldn't have come from there. But typhoid fever is a disease uh, that's spread by fecal matter and contaminated water or food. Recalling that Paris had the unhygienic uh, situation that resulted when the toilets weren't flushed for three weeks uh, and the water supply having been curtailed by court order, court order and the well water having been contaminated, it becomes more likely that this was a possible source of infection. In, that is, Paris was the source of infection and not Sherman. Moreover, both Hall's explanation and the one that I put forth in these pages uh, also fit the natural history of typhoid fever. With an incubation period of six to 30 days, it is entirely possible that Hall imported students who were not symptomatic at the time, and they became so over time. If this was the case, the epidemic was a manufactured crisis caused by the neglect of incarcerating young children in conditions conducive to the spread of disease. 
By the time of the typhoid epidemic, again, bureaucrats in Washington began to take diseases in, in Indian country and particularly in boarding schools quite seriously. They launched their first system-wide health directives in the late 1890s. And the BIA afterwards devoted resources to studying and combating disease. Um, and these, the, they would send out circulars, uh, which are essentially directives to Indian agents and superintendents outlining acceptable sanitary practices and regulations aimed at curbing disease incidents. Still, year after year, appropriations were not enough to adequately care for the children under the government's care. Um, Hall, after this epidemic, continuously reports uh, barefoot and nearly naked students on the school's ground to his superiors. And he again asks for an increase in appropriations in 1906, explaining that, quote, the amount allowed per capita for maintenance of Indian children of $167 per year is practically the same as allowed 10 to 15 years ago, while he noted that the expenses have risen 50, approximately 50 percent during that same time period. So you have you have the same amount of money with less less purchase, purchasing power. And indeed, increased appropriations did not come and students continue to suffer the consequences. So I go through the 1904 epidemic to, to show first how the school responded and how it was reported that the disease and death were kind of glanced over in official reports, but also to show that Sherman and boarding schools weren't simply death factories. Attempts were made to safeguard student health. However, they were often reactionary and limited by congressional appropriations. So unlike the, the 1904 epidemic, which was reported, there are others that apparently went unreported and until now have remained unknown. And I'm going to bring you through kind of how I found this epidemic in, in the school's records. So on Monday, November 30th, 1911, again, we're jumping kind of seven years from the, from the last typhoid epidemic or less very serious typhoid epidemic. Um, so in October of 1911, uh, Nathan Reed from Laguna Pueblo left Sherman for a nearly 700 mile journey back to his home, Perrier Village in present day New Mexico. Having been at the school uh, since October of 1909, Nathan arrived at the school's hospital two years later at the beginning of October 1911 and was placed under special um, observation, which is an often used diagnostic technique for suspicious tubercular cases. Basically gives the doctor a chance to, to monitor the, the student. Um, likely scared, the 19-year-old student ran away from the hospital. School authorities soon apprehended and detained him. And according to his sister, Nathan left the school hospital to get word of his, his sickness to his family. Uh, the school didn't let sick students write letters, or more, more precisely, students wrote letters in class. And when a student was in the hospital, they weren't in class, so they didn't write letters. Then towards the end of October, October 27th, Dr. Robley, the school's doctor who I had mentioned before, diagnosed him as having tuberculosis in both lungs and recommended that he be sent home. The superintendent, Frank Conser, issued letters to the boy's superintendent and also to his family, but apparently the letters never arrived as Nathan's coming was unanticipated. Laguna's agent recalled, Nathan arrived unattended on a cold day and had six miles to travel. To reach his home and this is all uphill and with a light nighttime low of 28 degrees fahrenheit on november 1st the young man unprepared and undoubtedly weakened from his tubercular infection made it home from the train depot his family was extremely distraught at his condition nathan's father reported quote when they took my boy away they promised he should have the best possible care and that they deceived and lied to me Henceforth, Nathan's, Nathan's sister recounted, no white man shall darken his door. Nathan's case indicates a breakdown of communication and also a neglect to properly care for students in federal custody. It is unknown whether Nathan died at his home from his infection, but it is likely given that there was no cure for tuberculosis in 1911 and his dreadful condition upon reaching his home. Further, Nathan does not appear in the 1920 Laguna census. His and other boarding school student files confirm a startling pattern. Sherman Institute and other off reservation boarding schools had repeated health crises, repeated health crises. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Nathan's story is just one of thousands of American Indian children and young adults who died while in federal custody or were sent home seriously ill and died shortly after. He was the 20th student. 2-0, 20th student to be sent home sick from Sherman in 1911. In the months prior to his positive tubercular diagnosis, several epidemics besieged the school, 
including, as you can see in the screen, in November of 1910, 150 cases of diphtheria. Uh, and another unknown epidemic, and this is the one that I've kind of found through Nathan's, Nathan's file, that happened between February and March of 1911. The school's voluminous extant correspondence to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Indian agencies, and individual families makes no mention of this epidemic, nor does any of the existing scholarly literature. Perhaps Nathan was one of these patients during the epidemic, but no hospital data exists in his student file. And although the school never reported the epidemic, it is clear that some disease or combination of disease was responsible for such a severe outbreak. So again, nothing in Sherman's kind of vast correspondence to Washington, D.C., annual reports or in its investigations by the Bureau of Indian Affairs mentions an epidemic in the beginning months of 1911. It is possible that the records have been destroyed. But if there are no letters and reports documenting an epidemic, how do we know one took place? Student files disclose significantly more than the school's correspondence and investigation reports. These on the screen you can see are uh, something called student record forms and they detail the student's academic performance and they reveal something out of the ordinary. Between the months of March and April the school essentially shut down and this is on the, the bottom of the two. You can see AB and I went through and there's a, a ton of absent. AB stands for absent and then eventually I came to a couple as you can see on the top that said sick or hospital or the abbreviation HOSP. So the school admitted at least 36 students to the hospital during this epidemic. So this amount of sickness confirms some level of epidemic disease. The epidemic was also apparently serious. The school's doctor, Robley, who I mentioned before, authorized 14 to 16 students to go home during the epidemic, and another 10 to 12 students went home the second half of the year ill, many with tubercular conditions. Uh, it's entirely likely that the tubercular infections were a complication from this unknown epidemic or previous outbreaks. The key to determining the cause of the epidemic is in two student files. There's literally two letters out of the 19,000 plus student files that I'll get to in a, in a second. So on February 13th, 1911, if you go back to the last thing, that's the, the first typhoid diagnosis in 1911. Um, Superintendent Consor wrote a letter to the Klamath Agency Superintendent Edson Watson to about two students who were lost in San Francisco. Um, they were in federal custody, but somehow were missing. So, so Consor wrote to talk about those two students, but in addition, he wanted to inform um, Watson that Horace Hill, a Klamath student who had been at Sherman again since 1909, had recently been admitted to the hospital with typhoid fever. The following month, on March 15, 1911, Consor wrote to Paiute student George Lawrence's superintendent. He explained that George was ill with typhoid fever. While the boy at the time was not uh, serious, in a serious condition, the school acknowledged that typhoid fever, quote, is of course a disease that is always dangerous. George's case caused the doctor some concern. And two weeks later, the superintendent again reported to MOPA, this time explaining that George's condition was not improving and that the school didn't hold out much hope to be able to pull the boy through. However, four days later, George reportedly improved and was out of danger, or so the school thought and reported. As often happens, students would recover from their primary infection only for secondary complications to arise. The most common complication was the development of tuberculosis. On April 14th, Dr. Robley diagnosed George with tubercular peritonitis, which is a deadly disease marked by a low-grade fever, um, night sweats, weight loss, malaise, and uh, swelling in the abdo abdominal cavity. Sherman's superintendent conceded that this disease, quote, is probably more serious than the typhoid fever. Eight days later, the doctor requested to perform a surgery, but acknowledged that even if successful, George might develop pulmonary tuberculosis, and ultimately the doctor did not hold out very much hope for George's recovery. The Sherman superintendent added, I do not believe that George will ever be in the condition to be sent home. And indeed, five days later, he died on April 27, 1911. Meanwhile, Horace Hill, the student who was diagnosed in February with typhoid, also developed tuberculosis, and he was sent home in May of 1911. He died at his home between the months of August and October. Uh, 
before I say anything about this picture, I want to say that this is a staged photograph of Sherman's Hospital in the 1930s. So none of these these patients, these women patients, are actually patients. Uh, they're actually healthy students. But the nurses and nursing assistants actually perform those those jobs. So although the two student files contain um, the only two references to typhoid fever, it is likely that the disease was the culprit of this unknown and previously unreported epidemic. These two cases prove that typhoid was in the school between February and April, the same time as this unknown epidemic. The high number of children admitted to the hospital suggests a highly contagious disease. And the numbers who died or were sent home ill suggests that the disease was serious. Typhoid fever is both of these. Sherman also had other outbreaks of typhoid fever around the same time. So it's possible that this 1911 epidemic was actually a continuation of the outbreak that began when the first student, Robert White from Round Valley, was diagnosed with typhoid fever on December 6, 1910, kind of amidst that 150 case diphtheria epidemic. Strengthening this possibility is Robert was sick in the hospital through April uh, when he was returned to Round Valley too ill to continue his enrollment. Still, there's no evidence between Robert's case in December of 1910 and then the case of Horace in 19, February of 1911. Then in April, Dr. Concert diagnoses Carmel Calic, a Rincon band of Luisania woman with subacute nephritis and edema or the buildup of fluid in the body. Her heart couldn't handle the increased stress and she died at the school on April 30th, 1911. So although no sources indicate whether she was diagnosed with typhoid, uh, nephritis or inflammation, inflammation of the kidneys has been linked to typhoid fever in the medical literature since about the eight, late, uh, I'm sorry, late 1800s. And there was another burst of typhoid cases in August through December of 1911, which sickened at least six students. These outbreaks may have been caused by a chronic carrier or an unresolved contagious, uh, contagion source but all of these factors um, indicate that the previously unknown epidemic was typhoid fever. In total, Sherman witnessed at least 50 cases of typhoid between December of 1910 and December of 1911, and four students died at the school. Two more died shortly after going home sick, and the school sent home an additional 27 students. Um, the other thing I wanna say is this epidemic is probably uh, an undercount because I didn't realize while I was going through the records what I was looking at. And I probably got, you know, a thousand, two thousand, maybe even more student files deep before I realized that something was up. Um, and I just didn't have time to go back and look through all those student records again. But likely that 50 number is, is very low. So how was the epidemic hidden and why was it, uh, and why was it not reported? So I haven't worked out some reasons why, although I could venture a guess that uh, they just didn't give a damn. Um, that is, these children were acceptable collateral damage in the quest for total assimilation. But the epidemic was hidden by simply not reporting it to Washington and omitting it from the school's annual report. This calls into question the accuracy of government reports and reminds us to be cognizant of what is not reported, kind of reading, reading the archives against the grain. Archival evidence also confirms the need to question other school documentation, but reinforces the, the importance of individual student files. Despite fires, floods, and general destruction, there remains many millions of documents related to boarding schools. So Paris's records, um, or Sherman's records, Sherman has 19,251 student files across 669 boxes in, in in an industrial building, actually in Paris. It's called the National Archives at Riverside, but it's in Paris where the first school was. Um, the remnants of, of hospital logs, scraps of paper, letters from relatives, and financial letters were never intended to be pieced together to provide glimpses into the school's lethality. This process, however, recovers the students who have been what I term administratively disappeared. That is, the students who attended the school but no records survive providing details of their uh, attendance or departure. Because files are unavailable or have been destroyed, there's no indication that many of these students uh, attended the school if it wasn't for one little scrap of paper that indicates an illness, a desertion, or death. And there will literally be scraps of paper that are no bigger than, you know, let's say two inches by three inches that'll have a name, a date, and some explanation. And it'll be in somebody else's student file. 
So in the case that I, I started with, um, that student who died in 1903, the only notation of his death was the school justifying the purchase of a coffin during a financial audit. The reasons for these missing records are, are unclear, but they raise, um, they raise issues about our accuracy and raise questions about how other students, how many students have been deleted from the archival record by the federal government. Um, the typhoid, the typhoid epidemic, also shows us that we we know much about the students who remained at the school, including those who recovered, um, and those who passed away at the school. But we know virtually nothing about the at least 26 students who went home ill. In fact, we know very little about most students who went home ill across all schools. Sherman superintendents and other boarding schools sent home scores and scores of children uh, who are ill. So double digit cases of students too ill to continue their schooling became normalized. By 1916, the Indian Affairs Commissioner at that time was Cato Sells, explained of the situation, quote, we cannot solve the Indian problem without Indians. We cannot educate their children unless they are kept alive, period. Boarding schools did not do a very good job of keeping children alive. Students dying at the school looked bad, so superintendents often shipped them home. Medical historian David Jones asserts that students were returned home even, either in a coffin or as walking dead men to spare the school burial costs. And thousands of children died in these institutions. So how did families find out about the diseases? As I mentioned before, students wrote letters. Um, so these students were often hundreds or thousands of miles away from their home, and most of the families were not directly um, told about illnesses or desertions, but they would know something was wrong when the monthly letters stopped appearing. They feared and they worried and they would write letters to the school inqu inquiring about their children or some relative's health. And this graphic that you see on your screen is, uh, is some word art of the most common words and letters between families, schools, and uh, reservations. And I've eliminated the financial letters so you can get a sense of some interesting things. So obviously uh, tuberculosis is, is a large word. Measles is probably the second largest disease um, on the screen and we haven't even talked about measles in this presentation at all, but measles uh, was extremely deadly, uh, extremely prone to producing the complication of tuberculosis. And it really, uh, the latter half of Sherman's existence um, and the period that I look at from about 1909 to 1930, there were several big measles epidemics and you'll see the epidemics in a second. The other thing to note about this is you see a couple of years, 1909 is kind of in the center and 1929 is all the way at the right. And uh, it took me a, a little while to figure out why this was, but both of these years there are serious investigations going on at the school. So in 1909, um, it, Dr. Uh, Joseph Murphy, who's the BIA head medical director, arrives at the school actually in the middle of measles epidemic, and he sends tons of letters. That's why it's kind of overrepresented there. And then in 1929, the California Tuberculosis Association was at Sherman um, screening the students, providing x-rays because the school did not have an x-ray machine, uh, and also prescribing treatment to students. And a lot of those students would then go to uh, who were positive would go to tuberculosis sanatorium throughout the state and out of school because technically all students who had tuberculosis were forbade from attending school. Although that's not actually what happened. So disease was central in the American Indian boarding school experience uh, experience, and, and this is uh, a table of just some, some of the serious epidemics Epidemics at Sherman. There's actually quite more. I can't fit them all on a page. Um, but even those who escaped diseases themselves, their classmates, siblings, and teachers caught diseases, disappeared to the hospital, possibly to never return. Schools did take steps to mitigate the impact of disease, yet high rates uh, continued unabated for decades. Superintendents ignored directives, and it had deadly consequences. This table, again, shows some of those serious epidemics. Um, you can see the, the 1909 measles epidemics the, and the other epidemics throughout the school's history. And you notice through 1911, 1912, 1913, uh, there's a string of typhoid epidemics that don't appear all that serious in terms of the number of cases, 
but these are all um, liable to be undercounts because I'm still working through the data. So another problem that these epidemics raise, particularly the, the 1904, 1907, uh, is the accuracy of the reasons that schools reported that students left. I'm gonna give you a little patient narrative to illustrate this, but in the school's student files, you'll often see time out, time expired, home, which all should be indicative that a student had completed their term of enrollment, which varied between three and five years, although uh, they would often be, be re-enrolled sometimes against their own will, often against their own will. Um, however, many letters in the student files confirm that six students were sent home under the auspices of their terms being expired. So Beulah Quicut, who's a, who's a Ute girl, um, arrived, she was 14 when she arrived uh, in 1925 to Sherman. Apparently healthy, she had her, her reservation physician fill out a, um, a medical form and she was screened by the school's doctor. They both gave her a clean beer bill of health and she had a pretty uneventful term of enrollment for three years at Sherman, uh, according to her records. Uh, then on June 5th, 1928, when her term of enrollment had expired, Superintendent Frank Conser escorted her to Salt Lake City. Uh, almost immediately on Beulah's return home, her mother reported the girl ill to the agent, H.M. Uh, Tidwell, uh, the Utah superintendent, and he reported that, quote, Beulah has been bedfast since returning from Sherman, and I have been wondering if she was ill before leaving school. Her people hardly recognize her, as they tell me, saying she is so much thinner than when she went away, end quote. And, and Indian people at this time were very aware of the effects of tuberculosis. They were quite used to their children going away healthy and coming home as kind of emaciated skeletal figures of their, their former selves. So upon receiving this letter from, from the superintendent, Conser at Sherman reported it to the employees and asked for a response. An internal memo from the school's matron, L. Pearl Ryan read, quote, Beulah was not ill before leaving Sherman, end quote. But her hospital records tell a very different story. Evidence suggests that Beulah's health began to wane the last several months at Sherman. She lost weight, looked pale, but ran no temperature immediately before going home. During a routine ex examination of the student body that February, so February of 1928, Dr. Robley flagged her for future or for further observation, like he had done 17 years earlier to Nathan Reed. The doctor ordered her an additional um, ration of milk to supplement her nutrition and combat weight loss. And it was clear that Beulah was not healthy, but no discernible diagnosis could be made. Then on May 2nd, she was admitted to the hospital with the flu and discharged 16 days later, which was an above average stay in the hospital for the flu at this time. Moreover, when Conser escorted the girl home to Salt Lake City, he noted, quote, Beulah coughed quite badly but he overlooked notifying her agent. Despite the months of observation, a case of the flu, severe coughing on the way home, the school never notified uh, the agency or Beulah's family that she may be in below average health. This precluded her from receiving medical attention and likely exacerbated her poor health and underlying infection. She died at her home surrounded by family on June 29th, 1928, less than one month after returning. This sort of behavior uh, echoes what historian Kevin Whalen asserts uh, when students were neglected, quote, kind of beyond school walls. Now, once students left, uh, the schools didn't keep track, care for uh, students in its custody. And this uh, is the same thing for the outing system. So student files also do something else. Student files also help us find missing children and identify individuals that some tribes wish to repatriate or locate. Indigenous students were quite mobile in the late 18th, early 19th centuries. Um, automobiles, boats, buses, horses, trains, and trolleys carried them to and from school on a nearly daily basis. The outing program took them out into industrial farms, into businesses and homes. Um, sometimes students disappeared, whether they ran away or died in that on outing and their burial place remains unknown to their communities in part because the school didn't always notify families when their children ran away or died. So boarding school, uh, actually before I go there, I want to point out this map 
uh, to give you a sense of the the expanse of Sherman. This is a map of the Sherman students in my database, so you can kind of see where they come from. And these aren't all Sherman students, but these are the students who failed to complete their term of enrollment. You can see California and the Southwest, Arizona and New Mexico are very heavily represented, but you have a bunch from uh, Oklahoma, the Pacific Northwest, you have some students from Hampton, which is that, that kind of magenta dot all the way in Virginia, um, and the rest of the states. So boarding school outcomes related to health are relatively poor. Again, thousands of children and young adults died, and, and many more uh, were left to uncertain fates that we just don't know the outcomes of. So in response, more recently, the National Congress of American Indians has passed several resolutions related to historical trauma and boarding schools. In 2014, a couple of years after NABS was founded, they initiated the goal of education and healing from historical and intergenerational trauma, specifically noting uh, boarding schools. Two years later, this grew into a call for, quote, the United States to acknowledge its role in the U.S. boarding school policy and to acknowledge for the American Indian and Alaska Native children who did not survive as a result. And in 2017, they passed another resolution calling to collect testimony about missing children. Boarding school student files, like the ones that I've kind of explained throughout this presentation, are the clearest source to begin answering these questions and supporting indigenous sovereignty. We need a multifaceted approach for dealing with the legacy of American Indian boarding schools. Uh, first, and perhaps most importantly, we need to know where the records are. As Christine mentioned in her webinar, the last webinar, uh, former NABS board member and scholar Denise Lajmadir came up and found uh, at least 351 boarding schools um, across the United States. And this includes churches, church-run schools and on-reservation boarding schools run by the federal government. Yet we only know where the partial records are for 61. Are there other boarding school records among the approximately 243 million documents held by the federal government in the caves in Lenexa, Kansas, the American Indian Records Repository, which are apparently all BIA retired documents? Um, but what's in there, we really don't know. And that's a significant significant haul of documents, 243 million documents. Uh, what else is held by the churches and religious organizations that ran these schools? Historical records are necessary to understanding the physical impact of boarding school attendance on indigenous communities, but so are other types of records. Truth telling, oral testimony, cemetery and repatriation work. NABS is kind of at the center of all of this, working towards healing individuals and communities impacted by the boarding schools. So this paper and my work in general is meant to honor these community, these students, to help communities reach some sort of closure and to treat indigenous uh, students and communities with more dignity than the federal government uh, reports that ignored their students suffering through unsanitary confinement, inadequate nutrition and abuse of so many kinds in institutions predicated on cultural destruction. Thank you. Now I'll take questions with hopefully Rose's help. Great, thank you so much, Preston. It was great to hear your presentation and I'm sure we're gonna have a lot of questions from our audience members. Um, so we have a couple of questions that came in already, but I just wanna remind everybody that you can use the question feature on the right side of your screen to ask any questions. Uh, I'll be moderating them and directing them at Preston so he can answer them. Um, and I'll start with one that we got earlier in the webinar, which is about the Paris Indian School in particular. Um, Preston, somebody is wondering if the Paris Indian School is still standing, if the building is still there. It is not. Um, Paris, the, the photo that I showed of Paris is kind of from the side, and really Paris was only about three buildings. Uh, they had a big schoolhouse and a couple other buildings, um, but I do not believe that building was standing. In fact, you know, when the school closed, one of the reasons the school closed besides the, the water and sanitation issues is that uh, the buildings were dilapidated and falling apart. So when it would rain, I know it doesn't happen very often in Southern California, unless it's this year, um, the students would be getting wet because the, the rain would just come through the buildings. Uh, and in that situation, I'm guessing that all of them were, were raised at some point or fell down kind of naturally. Mm, gotcha, great, thank you. Uh, we get another question here asking about the impact of disease that was spread back home on reservations. So after children left with some of these diseases, what were the impacts as they returned home? 
This is actually a really great question. So as I mentioned, we know very little about um, the students who went home. Um, and there's a, there's a logical kind of archival driven logic for that, and it's that school stopped tracking students for a large part when they left. Um, that being said, students often served as vectors for disease. So one of the greatest examples of this is trachoma, which is an infectious eye disease uh, that could, without treatment, lead to blindness. So most Eastern indigenous communities think Haudenosaunee, Abenaki, Wabanaki, uh, that was a disease that they'd never had had. But when their students returned from Carlisle, they would bring the disease with them. And it would spark future epidemics at home. Tuberculosis was another thing that would do the same thing. So obviously tuberculosis is contagious at this time. It doesn't have really any treatments or certainly no curing treatment. And uh, so a student would come home and give tuberculosis to their siblings, to their parents, to people who were to around them. Um, so it functions as, as this chain. Um, and the extent, of, the, really the extent of that contagion, we don't know. But I'm hoping, uh, I'm actually heading to the archives tonight uh, to Kansas City, and I'm starting to look at uh, reservation records. And I'm hoping that some of the reservation records will will fill in some of the details for these students who went home and for the health conditions on, mm -hmm. on the reservations themselves. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we got a couple of other questions about the records, and I know you touched on that briefly in your presentation. Um, we have one person who's asking about boarding school records in general. Are they held by churches? Are they in the public domain? And how can people access them? Uh, and then one question specifically about records for Sherman after the 1950s. Um, are they held? Where are those records held? All right. So um, the, the boarding school records, the student files that I mentioned, are all held by the National Archives, at least for the big schools. And even the smaller schools, the smaller off-reservation schools, there are records for them, but they tend to be in reservation records. So for instance, Genoa's records, Genoa's a school in Midwest and Nebraska, for instance, the Pine Ridge students. The Pine Ridge students, their student files are actually in the Pine Ridge reservation records and not in Genoa's. There's no Genoa kind of series in the National Archives. Um, they are publicly available for the early period. So all of these records at one point were under US privacy law. And so US privacy law says that you can't look at records that are for somebody who's alive and younger than I think about 75. So today the records through about the early 1940s, kind of World War II era are all public records. And eventually all of these will be public records. Um, but my hope is um, that these records actually go where they belong, back to the tribes themselves, rather than sitting in a federal repository. Um, so, so again, to reiterate, the big schools, their records are actually quite good, and they're essentially located. Um, Carlisle's records are all in Washington, D.C. Haskell's, all in Kansas City. Um, Sherman's, all in Riverside, and Chamawa's are all in Seattle. The smaller schools, you wind up getting into situations where you may have to travel to any number of uh, NARA locations. So Genoa's records realistically are in probably 15 different locations all across the United States. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll you know, add that the, a lot of the church-run schools are outside of the federal records that you're talking about in those um, big institutions and so those are those are a little harder to find certainly. Yeah, so the, the national government, the National Archives has no records for church run schools besides they would have correspondence. The correspondence will be in the National Archives. Absolutely. And uh, as Preston mentioned, NABS is also very interested in making these records more accessible to particularly boarding school survivors and descendants. And we're currently in the process of planning and applying for funding for a national digital archive of boarding school records that would compile these different records and make them more accessible for folks so they don't have to travel to all those different archival locations like Preston was talking about. Uh, Preston, we got another question about the records that's um, a little bit more specific about how to access them once you know where they are. Um, somebody is wondering how would you go about requesting records if you're interested in perhaps the set of records of a certain school and you do know where they are? 
Um, so it's actually quite an easy process. Um, assuming that the records are in the public domain, so before you know the 1940s, you typically would send an email or call the National Archive location that has the records, let them know that you're coming. Um, you show up, show them your ID, they give you a card, uh, you fill out a form, you know, a pull slip, and they give you the records, and you sit in a room and you look at them. There's, there's, they're actually quite easy to, to. The hardest part is locating where the records are. Once you locate where the records are, it's quite easy to, to get them, assuming that you're close by. Great, thank you. Uh, one more question about sources for information in general. Um, when somebody is, you know, saying that they know where some of these records are, but wondering if you've been able to talk with any of the families that are associated with the children in your research. Um, like many Native American families, oral history can be a really key component of finding out information, and we know that making these records more accessible to boarding school survivors and their descendants would certainly allow those individuals to provide more information about the context of the history there. So have you done any of that work as a part of your research question? Yeah, so um, especially you know when I did that work for the missing students, um, going back to the communities is something that you you always try to do. Uh, and in some cases, I was successful in talking to, to some family members, um, which is really rewarding uh, in a way because they fill in they fill in gaps that you don't even know about. So for instance, um, there's one student who's currently missing at um, Carlisle. Um, and that, that little girl's brother actually died at Fort Lapwai at the sanatorium as a, quite, as a young man. They're both Native Alaskan. And uh, so I would have never known about the Fort Lapwai, Lapwai connection if it wasn't for reaching out to these families. Uh, so, so oral histories are, are really, really important. Um, that being said, I don't use them as much in my work, and there's a very particular reason for that. So my era stops in 1934. And so... The, during my period, there are very few boarding school survivors left from, from my era. Um, and the oral histories that you get in the later boarding school era are different than the early era. So in 1934, the reason I stopped, the so-called Indian New Deal, issues in, uh, and after the post-Miriam report, issues in a set of reforms that does fundamentally change the schools, although you can also make the argument that it doesn't change all that much. Um, so I look at these boarding school periods as, as two distinct periods, uh, kind of an early period and then the, the 20th century period, really from you know, the 1920s, 30s through the, the 70s and 80s. Um, and, and oral histories are even more important for that later period because you can't actually access the records uh, because they're still under privacy law. Um, but, but you know, the, the short answer is both are important, both historical records, oral histories, testimonies. You know, we need everything. Um, these schools are so, so understudied um, that anything is certainly better than what we have now. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, one question about resources. Um, what are some resources or speakers or programs that you would recommend to specifically non-tribal museums in order to share this history, share the voices associated with this history, um, and make these records more public? That's a big question. Um, <laughs> resources. Um, NABS. NABS is a great resource. The communities themselves. If you are, you know, a local archive that, or a local museum, and you have indigenous communities near you, you should be using them. Um, you know, go talk to people. Um, and then there's some, you know, there's a good amount of boarding school literature now that, that is starting to come out. Um, you know, really starting from, from Chanina and kind of before, you know, that, that work from the, the early 90s, let's say, that are that are case studies, and even the ones that aren't. So David Wallace Adams' uh, Education for Extinction is an incredible book that gives you a good overview of the boarding school system, both on and off reservation. Um, in terms of in terms of resources online, there aren't that many. Um, you know, I think a lot of a lot of communities have have um, 
A lot of communities have different priorities. And that is not to say at all that that healing is not one of them. Um, but this is a this is a really new conversation that's happening um, in the United States. Um, you know, you had the Canadian TRC that you know finished up in 2015, and while that was going on, you started to see well, you know, native communities in the United States being like, well, where do you think they got the idea from? Um, you know, and that comes from obviously the United States. Canada sent down a delegation to Carlisle, looked at it, and said, well, this is great. We're going to bring a version of it back to Canada. Um, but it, it really is, it's a, it's a new conversation that's happening, uh, one that I'm excited to see where it goes. Um, but because it is so new, the resources are quite limited. Um, again, this comes back to, to the issue of what we know and what we don't know, um, or what we know and what we can prove. Sure, absolutely. Uh, another question about resources. Uh, this time, someone is interested in learning about any resources or sources that could be used to connect students' physical health at the schools with the trauma that they experienced um, and the way that that's impacted them and their descendants long term. Sure. So you also have, again, this is quite new. You have the epigenetics conversation happening uh, with with Holocaust survivors, but also boarding school survivors. So that's the most the most concrete, detailed um, kind of scholarship now. Um, but you have all this research about, you know, allostatic load, allostatic load, that, you know, the levels of stress on a body um, that's starting to come out as well that are mostly in, in medical journals. So the journal of the American Medical Association has had quite a few um, articles over the years. Um, medical anthropologists have been working on this. Um, and the IHS is also starting to do some some work. Um, I mean, I, the NABS the NABS panel uh, in October that I was on had one of the deputy directors of the IHS on it, uh, who himself is a descendant of boarding school survivors. Um, so the IHS is also starting to to recognize the link between uh, Indigenous health today and Indigenous health in the past, and trying to design programs to to preserving health and having better outcomes. Sure. That's great to hear. Uh, one more question for you about the history of Sherman. Uh, we have somebody whose father was a student at Sherman and is wondering if you have more information or perhaps um, a place to point them to more information for the history after 1933, so really after what you talked about today. There's... Um, Sherman, besides Carlisle, is the most written about boarding school. Um, that being said, there are some caveats. Um, so Matt Gilbert's work is mostly about, um, is about Sherman and particularly Hopi students at Sherman. So you get some kind of tribally specific history. Um, and then after, after 1933, you have a book by Diana Barr, her last name I believe is spelled B-A-H-R, and it's called The Student, Students at Sherman. And it's actually not about students at Sherman, it's actually about kind of the BIA brats that, um, or so-called BIA brats, um, you know, who's, who, children whose parents, indigenous parents worked at the school uh, and grew up at the school. Uh, but that book, fundamentally based on oral histories, uh, takes you through a kind of a later period. Um, and now, you know, there's there's also really no no Sherman history that brings us through the present. You know, of the schools that I study, Haskell, Sherman, and Chamawa are all open in some capacity today. So anything that claims to be a comprehensive history is is uh, it's a monumental task to cover you know 100 plus years of these institutions. Um, but they're really Generally, there's not many literature, not many books um, past, let's say, the 19, 1940s. Uh, the vast majority of boarding school literature stays um, stays on the kind of older side, so the 1879 through 1934 period. That's the most common time breakdown. Um, but if that person uh, wants to email me, uh, or you know, we can, I can think more about some sources, and we can. Uh, I'll pass them along. Great, thank you so much. Great, thank you so much.
So we have time for about one more question, and I want to end with one that asks about your research process um, and how you've gone through this research. Uh, so this person said, you know, Preston opened up by talking about the emotional weight of this topic and some of the trauma that it can bring up. And um, if you're willing to share, they're interested to hear how you're dealing with the emotional aspects of this research and how you take care of yourself as you engage in this really heavy topic. It is it is very difficult to write about dying uh, and dead children um, on a daily basis. Um, so first and foremost, you you do have to take care of yourself. Um, I tend to be a workaholic, uh, which doesn't lend itself to self care. Um, but you know, I think as I've gotten older and deeper into this research, I've realized that there's a time and a place to to put everything down, to step away from it, not necessarily to stop thinking about it, but um, to to take a break. Um, it, you know, it, what really helps too is um, is the positive the positive support. You know, I mentioned all the organizations in the beginning um, because they've supported me throughout this research, um, and without them, this wouldn't have gotten done. Number one. But uh, to have that community, to have that community to go to, to bounce ideas off of, um, to say, and to be honest with your struggles, I think that's really important as well. Um, you know, this, again, this work isn't easy, but I think at the end of the day, the, the end goal is, is worth the, the pain and suffering that goes into it. Great, thank you for sharing. And I'll just mention that NAV's created a resource list this year that is now available on our website. Um, it provides different resources for healing and for trauma-informed um, care that you can that you can connect with or line, uh, crisis lines that you can call if you want to talk to somebody about your experience, um, whether it's your personal experience or experience doing some of this work. And we encourage you all to take care of yourself as you're learning about these topics. Well, thank you so much, Preston, and thank you so much to everybody who attended our webinar. Uh, we're great to have all of you here to learn with us and learn more about this history. I just want to encourage everybody to sign up for the next webinar in our series, which will be done by Dr. Brenda Child on April 19th. And you can check out our full list of webinars on our website events page, where you can see the full schedule for our 2019 series. Uh, and I know a lot of people have asked us when these webinars are going to be um, available or if they'll be available to access online. I uh, just want to let everybody know that we will be making the recordings available online at a later date. So uh, please stay tuned for that. A great way to keep informed about the work that we do and when those webinars will be available is to sign up for our e-news, which you can do on our website. Awesome. Thank you, Thanks Rose. Thanks so much, and everybody have a great day. Yep. Thanks, Preston. Thank you.